Hello and welcome to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg. You all know Teddy at this point. My dog, who is uh, feeling very restless right now, very playful, so I don't know how long he's going to last in this Friday Reads. Oh, probably not long at all. <laughs> um, yeah, he wants down. So that didn't work out very well, but at least you got a look at Teddy, and I think he was sitting long enough in my lap that I could get a picture for the thumbnail. So that's something. He's currently at my feet chewing on his favorite ball. He seems a lot more happy doing that than he is sitting. He's He wants to be a lap dog, but he's too restless. He has too much energy, so he tends not to sit still for very long, which uh, Jamie had that. She did, was not good at relaxing, but she loved a snuggle so she could sit in your lap. But um, yeah, so he's very happy where he is. And he's been doing great. We went to the vet and he got um, a, a checkup for his tooth extraction. He had one of his front teeth extracted. It broke while he was in the wilderness, which is not a joke. <laughs> he was found outside of Yellowstone. No one knows how long he was in Yellowstone. But uh, he had broken a tooth, so they had to remove it. And uh, it's healing really nicely. So we have to wait another week before we start giving him hard foods. But he's doing really, really well. And that is great. Anyway, I'm here to do my Friday Reads video. This is where I wrap up the week in reading and talk about any exciting bookish things that have happened during the week. I finished three books and I have a fourth on the way. I'm actually filming this on Friday. I have been moving toward filming on Thursday, so I have Friday to edit these and then post them on Saturday. But I had been hoping that I would finish a book last night and that did not end up happening. So it is what it is. The big thing that happened this week in the book world is, of course, the National Book Awards. I will have a link to my reaction video in the description box down below if you would like to check it out. It's a fun ceremony. You know, I, typically, I didn't follow the National Book Award as much as I follow the Pulitzer Prize. But they've had a lot of really solid winners in recent years, and I love the work that they do against censorship, and just to promote literacy. So I've become even more of a fan of the National Book Award in recent years. I also talked about where my Pulitzer Prize obsession started in a deep dive about interpreter maladies, and I'll have that video linked down below as well. The National Book Award this year, a great group of winners, very interesting books that I would like to read. It is all I can do not to call Montana Book Company to order copies of Blackouts and The Words That Remain, which was the winner for Literature in Translation. I really want those books, and I'm trying not to... My wallet can't take it, so I I am trying to resist the urge to order copies. I'm sure Montana Book Company actually has Blackouts in stock, but I'm sure I would have to order The Words That Remain. And I, it's just... So I'm on hold at the library. I think there are four people ahead of me for Blackouts, and I'm really interested in reading that book. And The Words That Remain is not available through any of my subscription apps, and the I, the audio actually doesn't come out until next year. And I, I recommended that my library purchase the title, and they have not responded to that, and it's been a while. So at this point, I'm kind of wondering, maybe I should just assume that they're not going to? I don't know. But anyway, so the National Book Awards, a success, and I talk at length about them uh, in the video that will be linked down below. The other big thing, and this is more of a heads up for what is going to be coming next week, other than Thanksgiving in the United States. Thanksgiving is a weird holiday because it's, it celebrates... We don't need to get into it. But anyway, I love the food and the company, the gathering. I, I love all of that. So I will always love Thanksgiving. It is my second favorite holiday after Christmas. Anyway, uh, so the Washington Post announced its top 10 books of 2023, and they announced it toward... I, I didn't see it until the end of the day yesterday, so I wasn't able to film a video yesterday. I'm hoping that I will be able to film a video about it today, and then I'll do my Friday reads on Saturday, and then I'll schedule the Washington Post one for Monday. If I can't, I had already filmed a video that I was planning to post on Monday. There's too much going on at <laughs> this time of year. So much going on. And it's all great, but it does start to feel a little bit busy. And yet it's exciting. It's uh, it's all good stuff. So they announced their top ten. If you want to look at what those books are right now, go ahead and do it. Um, but I will have a video coming hopefully on Monday. And then I can take the video that I had actually been planning to use on Monday and do that for Thursday. So that'll be like a Thanksgiving treat for you if you're in the United States and if you celebrate Thanksgiving. Because again, it can be a weird holiday. It, it's stressful and weird and it 
does have very odd origins. So, you know, if you celebrate Thanksgiving, it'll be a Thanksgiving treat for you. If not, it'll just, just be a Thursday treat. And that's pretty fun too. I'm wearing my Protect Trans Kids t-shirt today because I didn't feel like talking about this in my Friday Reads last week, but I had a rash of really hateful, negative, nasty comments on my channel. And what's funny is earlier this this fall, I was talking to someone and or just, it, it came up a couple of times. It, the people mentioned that they get hateful comments on their channel. And I would always say, oh, I don't really get a lot of those. And what this incident reminded me is that I do get a lot of those. They just usually come in waves. And it had been a while <laughs> since I had gotten a wave of that going on. It's like they... they someone finds you in a video wearing a Protect Trans Kids t-shirt, and it's like they tell all of their hateful friends, and then they're all leaving comments. And what's really weird is the recent batch of hateful comments were all clearly referring to the video that I did earlier this year, the Friday Reads that we did um, after Joel and I went to a Drag Queen Story Hour, and uh, two Drag Queen Story Hours, one in Livingston, Montana, and one in Bozeman, Montana. They were clearly referring to that, but they didn't comment on that video. It's just this bizarre thing. So they'll comment on other videos and say nasty, hateful things. And anything that was outright nasty and hateful was immediately deleted and blocked. I did actually respond to a couple of the ones that weren't directly hateful, but were clearly, you know, trying to tread in that direction and whatever. So the only reason I'm bringing it up is because I'm not going to stop wearing this t-shirt. I'm not going to stop protecting trans kids. I am a gay man who is, surprise, surprise, not a pedophile. <laughs> and if you think that, that's really your problem and you're showing a lot about yourself and who you are and the assumptions that you make about people just because of who they are. And that's wrong and weird and bad. And anyway, I'm going to keep wearing the shirt and I'm going to keep supporting trans kids. I will keep talking about it. I will keep talking about supporting drag queen story hours and fighting book bans and all that stuff. And if you don't like it, you don't have to be here and that's fine. So anyway, just thought I would mention that really quickly. Um, we did go to Seattle last weekend. We took Teddy. It ended up being not a very exciting trip for Teddy because it was a lot of time in the car. It's about an eight, nine hour drive from where we live to get to Seattle. Actually, we weren't in Seattle. We were outside Seattle, but it's just easier to say Seattle because if I say we went to Redmond, Washington, people don't know what I'm talking about. I'm sure people in the Pacific Northwest probably do, but there are a lot of people in other locations who wouldn't. So anyway, we went outside of Seattle, long drive for Teddy. And then when we got there, he couldn't go into the Christmas store that our friends operate. And uh, so he had to wait in the car a little bit while we were in there. And we couldn't find a place where we could go to dinner with him. So we had to just drop him in the hotel room. So he had a bit of a boring weekend, but he did get to explore Redmond. He did get to meet a bunch of our friends, uh, his aunt and uncle. Now he had actually already met his aunt. His aunt visited us. They're not blood relation, but they're close enough friends that they're aunts and uncles. And he really enjoyed that. So that was nice. The Christmas store was everything I kind of wanted it to be. And that was great. I will put a video at the end, uh, two videos at the end of this uh, that just show you what it looked like. And it it was magical. It was magical. I'm going to have to turn the sound off because Christmas music is playing in the videos. And I don't. I live in fear of YouTube because I once got a completely arbitrary strike on my channel for language, and I appealed it, and they reviewed the video in question, and I hadn't even cursed in the video, So, but I live in fear of this stuff now. <laughs> so the last thing I want to do is play music and have YouTube put a strike on my channel because I played music I wasn't supposed to. So it will be silent, but at least you'll be able to see what the store looked like. It was magical. We spent a lot of money. A lot of money, but all worth it, and it's going to be great. This coming weekend, we are actually going to be decorating the house for Christmas, which is great. Really excited about that. We had already scouted the tree, and I'm very excited. The only downside is I hurt my back 
Coming on two weeks ago, and it's been progressively getting worse, so I am sort of, like, I'm trying to look casual, but I'm sitting with, like, a pillow behind me, and I'm trying not to move my back all that much. It's, it's fun. And, uh, anyway, it's going to make decorating for Christmas a little difficult, but I'm going to do it, so... And anyway, I'm in physical therapy, and I have been in physical therapy, so, you know, I actually hurt my back in physical therapy, and you know what, let this be a PSA, listen to your physical therapist, because <laughs> he actually, we were doing an exercise, and he actually told me, it's like, I don't think you need to go as low as you're going, and stupidly in my head, it was like, oh, I got this, it's fine, and I hurt my back, so listen to your physical therapists, don't be a dummy like me, anyway. Uh, let's get into the extra Friday reads, because I did finish three books, and we should talk about them. So the first, two of them are audio, and we actually listened to them on the way to and home from Redmond, which is outside Seattle. The first one is Tic Tac Mistle Mistletoe by N.R. Walker. If you've been around for a while, and you remember, there's no reason you would have to remember, but when we were going back and forth between where we live and Pullman, Washington, for, to get treatment for Jamie... We listened to two other N.R. Walker books in this same series, but they were the second book and the third book in the series. Joel had already listened to the first, so that was where we jumped in when we were going back and forth between Pullman. And now, because Christmas is here, we kind of wanted something Christmas-themed, wanted something a little light and diverting, so a gay romance was perfect for that. And Joel said, you know, you never read the first book in the series. I thought it was really cute, so why don't we do it? So we did, and it was adorable. And so this is a series set in a town in Montana called Heartbridge. It's actually outside of where I live, is which is Missoula. The book kind of opens with a, a character arriving in Missoula. He's supposed to be going to Idaho, where his sister has lived. He's Australian. And... Because of a storm, his flight gets diverted to Missoula. So the book actually starts in the town where I live. And then he gets on the road to try to drive to Idaho because he's determined to get to his sister. He hasn't seen her in four years. And he ends up getting sort of stuck in the storm. He's never really seen snow because he's Australian. And he crashes and is rescued by someone who, of course, turns out to be a very handsome stranger, and romance ensues from that. And then the, in the second book, another Australian who has been working in Missoula in a restaurant is driving uh, west, probably to Seattle, and but he stops for a job in this town of Hartbridge, Montana, first, and finds love. And then the, in the third book, a guest at the inn from the second one uh, decides that he is going to settle in Hartbridge, and while he is renovating his house he finds love. So all of them are set around Christmas. They're all adorable. And it just sort of gives all of those great holiday vibes, great romance vibes, cinnamon bun vibes all over them. Just really, really cute. And I I really have enjoyed N.R. Walker as a romance writer. Joel has read some others uh, by this author that he has recommended to me, and I might dive into them probably next year. But uh, and it, what's also funny is because this is my third N.R. Walker book this year, N.R. Walker is tied with E.M. Forster for the most books that I have read by an author this year. So that's just funny. E.M. Forster and N.R. Walker. That's me in a nutshell. <laughs> so that was cute. We did that on the way over and we finished it pretty much uh, we actually finished it before we got to Redmond. So we started the next book, which was Lessons in Chemistry by Bonnie Garmus. About an hour before we got into Redmond, we listened to it on the way back as well. But there was still like an hour and a half or two hours left. And Joel was getting on the road on Monday. So he actually finished the book without me. And then when he was done, I picked up where we had left off and finished it myself. I had been wanting to read Lessons in Chemistry for a while. Joel had been thinking about reading it for a while. And the Apple TV series that was just released is sort of what gave us the kick in the pants to do it. We have a friend who read Lessons in Chemistry and absolutely loved it. I, I can't remember when she read it. I want to say it was over the summer, but like later in the summer. And she's been telling us to read it ever since. So we, so we had already had a sense of urgency to get to it. And then the TV series, because um, it's on Apple TV and she doesn't have Apple TV. So we're going to try to like have her over and watch the series with her, which will be fun. And I 
was a little surprised by the book. It wasn't quite what I expected because the way lessons in chemistry is sort of marketed, like the, the stuff you read about in reviews and blurbs online is that it is about a woman who was working as a scientist who ends up working on a cooking show. And she sort of becomes a Julia Child-esque figure. She becomes, the, the cooking show becomes wildly popular. Th that was what I knew about it, but the book actually really start, spends a long time talking about her career in science that she attempts to get off the ground and all of the ways that sh barriers were put up in front of her to prevent her from being a scientist. Uh, it, she starts out in college, has a really hard time getting a degree because she's a woman in the 1950s. And then she tries to go to a graduate school and, you know, triggers for sexual assault is all I will say. So she ends up not getting a graduate degree. She has to get a sort of demeaning job for what she's capable of in a lab. And she spends a lot of time fighting for recognition, for resources, and not getting them. She does fall in love with one of her co-workers at the lab, who's a man named Calvin. They have this very unique relationship. They end up not getting married, but they are very much in love. And she is rightly concerned that if she gets married, people are going to have expectations on her of what she should do, that she should you know, quit her job and she wants to keep up her job. She wants a career. She doesn't think she wants children. And she doesn't want her identity to be subsumed by her husband. And she knows that that's something that will happen, even if she keeps her name, even if she and her husband try to treat her like an equal, other people will immediately absorb her identity into her husband's. So that is the large focus of the beginning of the book. And it, you're about halfway through before you get to the cooking show. So I didn't re I thought the cooking show was the main focus of the book, and it's actually not. But that's not a bad thing, because so much of what happens in this book is really interesting. I do think it's a little too complicated. There's a little too much going on, because there's also a mystery around her husband's origins and uh, what happened to him when he was at a orphanage, essentially, as a child. Things that get sort of teased out over time throughout the book. And it could have, I think, eliminated one or two elements from the story. I also think the way it sort of moved back and forth in time was a little too tricky. I think it could have had... I, I don't think it necessarily needed a linear narrative. Like, I don't think you needed to start with her in college and just go <laughs> all the way through. The back and forth is fine. You could have a little bit of that. But I do think the way it sometimes shifted and it got a little dizzying sometimes in certain chapters. However, I really enjoyed the book. I loved the book a great deal. And I'm really excited to see how they adapt this into a series. I am a little concerned because... We pulled up the IMDb page to see who was in. I know Brie Larson plays the lead, but I didn't really know who else was in the show. And from who plays Harriet Sloan on the show, it looks like it's going to be a very different representation of that character. So in the book, Harriet Sloan is a middle-aged white woman who is a neighbor of our protagonist. The woman who plays her actually was one of the students on How to Get Away with Murder. And she is black. So I'm assuming that they're going to play up the civil rights angle a little bit in the show because it hints at that in the book. But but um, having a woman so young really changes everything that happens with that character. So it will be very interesting to watch the show and see how that plays out. I really liked the book and it was a very emotional. I think I did cry at the end, but not in a part that I would have expected, but I can't tell you what, what I cried at because it would be, a, it would be a spoiler. But it's just so emotional to read about women in the 1950s and 60s and knowing women I know, like, I have a friend who would have pursued a career in science, but knew it wasn't really an option. And knowing my mother and Joel's mother, Joel's mother really wanted a career. That's why she and Joel's father divorced. And luckily, they were able to stay friends for the rest of her life. It's a shame that women were put into such narrow boxes. And the book really, it doesn't feel like it's preaching, doesn't feel like it's getting on a soapbox, but it is very uncompromising in its view of feminism and what women are capable of. And I appreciate that. And I thought it was pretty well done. My only quibbles are, again, I'd, I'd say it's maybe a little too long. And I think that could have been solved by addressing the problem of a little bit too muchness, uh, maybe simplifying some of the storylines. Not all of the characters that are mentioned in one part have to come back later, you know, 
and uh, maybe just a little bit of work on the timeline, the way it shifts back and forth. Sometimes it feels a little much in a chapter, and maybe that was because we were driving. Who knows? But I really enjoyed this book, and I'm glad that I finally got around to reading it. Now I can't wait to watch the Apple show as well. The only other book that I managed to finish... them. <laughs> You can see, I'm trying to rotate without actually turning my body. <laughs> That's how my back is doing. So the only other book that I finished this week is So Late in the Day by Claire Keegan. Uh, this was released on Tuesday. I had pre-ordered it from Montana Book Company, and they managed to arrange it so that it arrived in the mail on Tuesday, which is really good. And I, I was so happy, and I immediately picked it up. I didn't manage to read it all in one day. Like I kind of started it and then finished it on Wednesday. So this is three short stories. I'm a huge fan of Small Things Like These, which is Face Out on the Shelf. Foster, great. Small Things Like These is, to me, the bar. Some people, the bar is Foster. To me, it's Small Things Like These. And I will say, I think if you told me rank the three Claire Keegan books, I'd say Small Things Like These, Foster, and then So Late in the Day subtitled Stories of Women and Men. So this is actually, you know when your reading accidentally has a theme? This is a very feminist book, really sort of, dis it's not a very feminist book. It's not as direct as Lessons in Chemistry, but it is very much talking about relationships between women and men. And what is really interesting about it is that it explores the line between these relationships where the sort of the ideal and where, where relationships between women and men can be supportive and loving and great. And the sort of narrow, blurry line where it tips over into the woman being subjugated or treated violently. And it's a very interesting ex exploration of that line. You know, I, it's interesting. So at least one of these stories comes from a story collection that is not published in the U.S. yet called Antarctica. And part of me is almost thinking, well, why don't they just give us that book? I feel like in the U.S. they're really trying to lean into this small book feel and, and giving us three stories put together continues that. And I would read the entire collection if it was available here. I am loving this vibe where we get we get one Claire Keegan book toward the end of the year every year and that they are small and digestible. I do love that. But I part of me even just wants to order Antarctica from the UK because with the internet being what it is now, that's an easy thing to do. So uh, I love this. I love Claire Keegan. And when I say that I think in my ranking, it would be toward the bottom. It's still head and shoulders over a lot of other things. Claire Keegan is a fantastic writer, and I really love it. I'm trying to remember, I think one of the stories had appeared in The New Yorker, and I don't remember. So, So Late in the Day, which is the first story, was published in The New Yorker in 2022. The Long and Painful Death, first published in Walk the Blue Fields in 2007, and Antarctica was first published in Antarctica, by, which was published in 1999. So her other collections are Antarctica and Walk the Blue Fields. So, and neither one of those have been released in the U.S. yet. So there's still more Claire Keegan that they can bring over, and I'm really hoping that they do. And I really wouldn't mind if they just gave us a whole collection. I don't need it to be like this, but it is fun to have this feel. I loved it. I would highly recommend it. I feel like I can't talk about the stories too much without spoiling them. But I will say I really loved this book. I absolutely love Claire Keegan, and I can't wait to see what they send over the pond to the United States next, or if she releases something new. Um, I This is an insta-buy author for me, for sure. And so late in the day, definitely, definitely pour that out. Interestingly, after we got home, so we listened to two audiobooks in almost two days. I did finish Lessons in Chemistry on Tuesday, but only like an hour and a half. And um, I feel like I got a little burned out on audio for the rest of the week because I have been planning what my next audio book is going to be. And instead, I keep just listening to podcasts. So I have not actually started another audio book. I have ideas on what I want to do next, but I think I just needed to give myself a little bit of time to uh, relax my ears. I did pick up a book called Whose Body by Dorothy L. Sayers. So Claire Keegan, spoiler for my November book haul, and actually this one as well. My November book haul is going to be massive, 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 massive. And that's because there was a, it, I keep saying it's a library sale just because that's the easiest way to explain it. The 
historical museum at Fort Missoula had a book sale. And I went and it was basically, you pay them $10, they give you a bag and you can fill the bag. And I went there on the last day. So if you filled your bag, they would just give you another bag for free. I got a lot of books and one of them was this. So I recently looked at Time Magazine's best uh, mysteries. I'll link that video down below as well. And this was one of them. And Dorothy L. Sayers is an author that a lot of people have recommended to me over the years because I do like that sort of classic whodunit style. So as I was walking through the book sale, I saw this and double checked on Storygraph and it's the first book. It happens to be the first book in the series where that follows Lord Peter Whimsey, which is interesting because the way it begins, there's no introduction to the character. This is not the first case that he has investigated. It's like starting in Medeus Res. <laughs> it feels like a later book in the series where everything has already been established. And there is something nice about that because it just goes. Um, the problem is, I am, I think, 60 pages in at this point. 65 pages in. And um, <laughs> so there are two victims. One of them, well, we don't know if one of them is a victim yet. The premise of the book is pretty much the title and uh, the illustration on the cover, which is kind of gruesome. A dead body just appears in a bathtub in a man's house one morning, and they don't know who he is. He's middle-aged and has been shaved. So they don't know who he is. They're trying to find out who the identity of this body is. Literally, it's the title of the book, Who is Body? The body is described as Semitic. And that's not... As soon as that happened, I was like, oh, I don't know. Is this going to be bad? Is this going to be really dated? And it kind of is. It's not over, but it's not great. Because... The, the other mystery is that a man named Reuben Levy has disappeared. And at first they want to know if he's the body in the bath, but it doesn't appear that he is, at least not at this point of the story. And Reuben Levy is also Jewish. So as they are beginning their in investigation, there are remarks about Jewish appearance. Some characters do kind of debate the character of Jewish people. It's not great. It's pretty dated. I am going to finish it. You know, it's just, a, it, it is a problem when you go back to these classic mysteries and thrillers. Like, Agatha Christie was not good on race and had similar problems in some of her writing. I actually just listened to a, an episode of the New York Times Book Review podcast where they were talking about how in the United States there is a push to edit anti-Semitic references in Georgia Heyer's novels out. And you know, when you go back to this time period... It's going to happen. That doesn't excuse it. It doesn't make it right. People should have known better. You know, and this was published before World War II. I don't know that it would have been better if it had been published after. This was published in 1923. In fact, World War II is actually what made Dorothy L. Sayers stop writing. So there are only 11 Lord Peter Whimsey books, I think, by her. Somebody else picked up the thread later. So that, you know, extremely dated, very problematic on race. I am going to try to finish it and see where I stand. I'm not entirely responding to Lord Peter Whimsey as a detective anyway, but it is fun. It's quick. You just have to roll your eyes a lot. So I'll finish that and uh, report back. So Teddy has me sitting on the floor because he wants to play fetch. And I'm doing it for him, but it's killing my back. But anyway, I'm back because I am a dumb dumb and I completely forgot. I DNF'd a book this week. I had started Holler Child by Latoya Watkins, which I had from the library, and um, wasn't quite getting into it or getting along with it. And I kept trying to force my way through it, and it wasn't working. So eventually I just said, why am I doing this to myself? And I did put it down. I, and I don't think it's the book. I think the book seems fine. It seems like a good book. <laughs> Teddy abandoned me to sit, to sit in the chair. Hang on. There he is. So let me angle this way so you can actually see him. Um, I, I don't think it was the book. I think it was mostly me. Um, and my... I wasn't in the feeling the book. It was it, it, The stories seem good. They're very um, down and a little bit difficult. And maybe I think I just wasn't really vibing with that right now. So I did DNF a book. It's the second book that I have DNF'd this year, uh, which is actually a pretty good track record. I will take that. Um, 
we need to see if I finish Stone Butch Blues before the end of the year, because I, I actually intend to get back to that one. So hopefully it won't end up being a DNF, but if I do, that would end up being three. Um, so I just wanted to throw that in and mention it. And there's your longer look at Teddy. Now, uh, back to the rest. I don't know if I'm going to manage to do a Friday Reads next week, because next week is Thanksgiving. So I, I'll try to figure something out, because if I can't do a Friday Reads, I'm hoping that I will have another video that I can film and schedule. Maybe I'll just film my Friday Reads ridiculously early in the week, because odds are, thanks, Thursday, I'm having turkey. I'm having turkey. <laughs> I leaned forward toward the camera and hurt my back. <laughs> uh, Thursday, I'm having turkey and I'm enjoying it. I'm not going to stop and film a Friday Reads video. And Friday, I don't know what our plans are. Traditionally, we use Black Friday to decorate the house. But last year, Joel suggested we decorate the house the weekend before Thanksgiving. So the tree will be up when people come over for Thanksgiving. And we really liked that. So that's why we're doing it this way again. So I don't know if we have plans on Friday. If we're not doing anything, I might film a Friday Reads we're going to see. I'm not committing myself to anything. But I'll try to have something for you next Saturday. It'll be the holiday. Just it'll, It might be difficult to film a video outside of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And I'm sure you all understand. So if I don't talk to you before next week, I, if you do celebrate Thanksgiving, if you are in the United States, I hope you have a good day filled with delicious food. I'm really excited about all the food. And company and, you know your family in whatever form your family takes, if it's your biological family, or if it's your chosen family, or if it's a blend of both. Whatever it is, I hope you have a really great day. And if, if you don't celebrate Thanksgiving, or if you're not in the United States, I hope you have a great Thursday. So anyway, that'll do it for today. Uh, I'm sorry, Teddy bailed. He's snoring on the floor next to me right now. But uh, at least you got to see him. As always, I really appreciate your time. I will be back. Until next time, happy reading.